The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. How many of you all are teachers? Okay, great. Any administrators? Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you all coming. Um, any pre-service teachers? You have not taught yet. Okay, teachers, zero to five years. You have zero to five years experience. Okay, great. Six to 10 years. Okay, great. 11 to 20. 20 plus years. I love you. I love you, 20 plus years, you're still learning. I love you, thank you all for coming. All right, here's our agenda for today. We're gonna start with introductions, we've already done that. Um, I'm gonna go over some objectives and norms. We're gonna do a little icebreaker activity since we're gonna be with each other for an hour and a half, a little bit less. We're gonna have a little icebreaker activity. We're gonna go over the misconceptions of the ESL child, and then we'll go into the principles of literacy development and ELLs. You will hear me use the term or the acronym ESL and ELL interchangeably. ELL stands for English Language Learners. ESL is the program English as a Second Language. So you will hear me use both of those acronyms interchangeably. Let's try this clicker. Clicker doesn't want to work. Okay. Can I get somebody to read that first bullet for me, please? The purpose of today's session. Clear up misconceptions about English language learners. Understand the key principles of literacy instruction for English language learners. Thank you. And can I get somebody to read that last bullet by the end of the session? Anybody? Yes. By the end of the session, the participants will leave with instructional strategies and resources to use to support the literacy development of English language learners in their classrooms. Okay. Norms, put your phones on vibrate. We're all adults in here. Um, you all know where the restrooms are. There is no parking lot. Uh, but I would like for you all to just keep it positive. That very first one, keep it positive. And minimize distractions and just listen actively. Okay, we're gonna do a little icebreaker called Two Truths and a Lie. And this is something that you all could use with your students. This is something I do with my kids. And to be an effective teacher, I'm going to model it for you first. So, how it goes, I give you three facts. Two of, them is tr two of them will be true and one will be a lie. And you have to figure out which one is the lie. So, here we go. Three things about me. I was named after an elephant. My favorite TV show is This Is Us. I wrote for a boxing website. I'm gonna give you all two minutes to figure out which one do you think is a lie. Turn and talk to everybody right now and try to figure out which one you think is the lie about me. Just on the little time you've known me. Okay, everybody's made a decision. Everybody made a decision. Okay, I'm just gonna have you all raise hands. How many of you all think number one is the lie? Okay, how many of you all think number two is the lie? Okay, how many of you all think number three is the lie? <laughs> My favorite TV show is not This Is Us. I, y'all, I watched that show one time. I watched it one time when it was set in Memphis. I watched it one time because they, it was all over the news. Oh, This Is Us is gonna be in Memphis, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, I'm gonna sit down and watch the show. I bawled my eyes out. I was 
like, how do people watch this every week? Oh my God, he died. I can't watch that show. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I mean, I was on Facebook like, say, how do you all watch this show? All of my friends were like, oh, I love this show. It makes me cry every week. What? I don't want to cry every week. No. No, but, uh, but back to what you were all looking at. Yes, I was named after an elephant. When I was born, when my mom was pregnant with me, the circus had an elephant named Tanya. And my mom thought the name was so pretty, so she named me Tanya. It's named after an elephant. Really, Mom? OK, and yes, I used to write for a boxing website. Ever since I was a kid, I watched boxing with my dad, and it just stuck. And I wrote for Inside the Ropes. I've gone to Vegas. I've sat ringside. I've covered fights. I know a lot of managers, publishers, promoters, boxers. I was actually sitting ringside when I took that, uh, when I took that picture. That's Deontay Wilder, heavyweight. Uh, U.S. heavyweight in Birmingham, Alabama, and I don't know if you all know who that guy is in the middle, but that's Floyd Mayweather. I mean, what happens when he fights McGregor? And, uh... Don't get me started. <laughs> Do not get me started on that farce. It is a ploy to drain millions out of the middle class. That's my feeling about that. I mean, let's have LeBron James uh, play basketball with Tom Brady and see what happens. Same difference. A football player and a basketball player, an MMA fighter and a boxer. Yeah, okay. <sighs> I digress. As you all can see, I really do not like that fight, but that's just me. Anyway, but yes, I used to. McGregor's going to win. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to put people out? No. <laughs> no, don't lose your money on it. Please don't. Anyway. Uh, I digress. As you all can see, I'm very pious. I'm still a fan. I just don't have time anymore to devote to writing for this website. But um, I wrote for about five years for that website. And then I fell into teacher leadership, and that kind of took over. And I didn't have any time anymore to do it. But yes, I used to write for a boxing website. <laughs> all right, so what I would like for you to do right now at your tables, I'd like for you all to do the same thing. Write three statements about yourself, and I want you to read them to your uh, people at your table, and you all have to guess which one is a lie. I'm going to call two volunteers, two brave souls. I'll give you all about five minutes. Five minutes to come up with three statements about yourself. Now, get Let's get a little creative. We don't want to say, okay, I have brown hair, I have green eyes, and I don't like plaid. Let's get a little more creative than that. Okay. Do I have a brave soul that would like to share? Sure. Yes. Okay. Preface this. I am from East Tennessee, so okay. I am a UT fan. Yeah. Uh, I have been in three state prisons, and I love yogurt. Mm -hmm. You're a yogurt. You're alive. You're a UT. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in three state prisons. That's the lie. No. Uh, that what? I am not a UT fan. <laughs> oh, does it work? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me take my thing out. He is not a UT fan, really? Well, I'm not either because I'm from Louisiana, go LSU, but. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody give him a hand. Thank you for being so brave. One more person would like to volunteer? Yes, Pretty Lady in Green. I've performed in an original musical at TPAC. I've eaten cat crap. <laughs> I've sold an original artwork for over $1,000. I hope there's a cat crap. <laughs> I'm hoping that too. 
You could not have eaten. So. It's a story from my child. Was it on accident? Yeah. Okay. Well, which one was the lie? <laughs> the last one I've sold an original artwork for over $1,000. Oh. You look artistic, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Okay. That is a strategy that you all can use, especially if you have older students. You could use that as an icebreaker activity or um, even mid-year just to kind of break the ice, you know, add some fun to your classroom. So now we're going to shift into the misconceptions of ESL learners, of ELL learners. It's my little summer school kids from last year. All right. This is what I'm going to do. How many of you all have heard of Four Corners? Okay, four corners, as you can see, I have letters at four corners of this room. A, B, C, D. This is a great way for you to quiz your kids, especially if you're doing test prep or you're doing some sort of a review. This is a fun interactive way to review those questions as opposed to them just checking it off. Yay, I got it right. No, I got it wrong. You can get them up and moving to break the monotony. So I'm going to do four corners with you right now with this question. How long does it take for an English language learner to become fluent in English? A, six months to a year, B, one to two years, C, four to five years, D, seven to 10 years. Everybody, yep, pick your answers. Question, how old is the learner? That's what I was gonna ask. Actually, this is a, any English language learner. Whether they are 6, 16, or 26. Yes. A, lots of B's, lots of C's, some D's. According to research, the average English language learner becomes fluent in four to five years. Define fluency. Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Not just speaking. All right? Okay, everybody stay there. Next question. Now we're going to do true, false. True is over here. False is over here. All ESL children learn English in the same way at the same rate. <laughs> <laughs> and you all are the smart class. False. We all know that this is false. It suggests that ESL students or ELLs with little or no prior education, look at what it's in blue, who may be illiterate in their first language may take seven to ten years. So if you have two children that come to you from Mexico, one can read in Spanish, the other one cannot or may not have even gone to school in Mexico. The child that is fluent in their first language, meaning they can read in Spanish, it'll take them about four to five years. The child that has interrupted education or has not learned how to read in his native language, it can take them up to 10 years. Also, as I said before, it's a gradual process that is strengthened with effective instruction. And that's what you all are going to learn today. Let's just think about it. What if we move to Japan? How long would it take us to learn Japanese? How long would it take you to learn Japanese? Six months to a year to become fluent in Japanese? OK. All right, next one. True or false, the ESL child who appears to speak English well is able to read and write at the same level. You all are so smart, I love it. They have what? What is it that they have? They have social language, okay? But they're still not fluent because they need reading and writing. 
And I've had that a lot. I have a lot of children, being that I'm in third grade, a lot of my um, children, they started in kindergarten. And when they come to me, they're, they're fluent speakers, listeners, but they're still struggling with reading and writing. Okay, and as I said before, it takes up to five years of English language instruction before they're able to read and write proficiently in English. Okay, next one, the ESL child who is silent in class does not fully understand English. They're silent, they don't understand it. That's why they're silent. She's changing her mind. You're absolutely right. I'm glad you all changed your minds. <laughs> I was like, get back over here. What are they in? How many of you all have heard of the silent period? Okay, good, good, good. So you know they probably understand you, but they don't feel comfortable enough yet with their oral language to tell you anything in English. Okay, and this is the progression. They usually acquire this first. They acquire listening first, then speaking, then reading, then writing. Okay, and of course, this is according to the research that is by Steve Krashen, the Bible, the guru of ESL research. All right, next one. Good first teaching for a native speaking speaker is good first teaching for an ESL child. So if you're, if you're a good teacher, you should be able to accommodate this ESL child the first time you teach it, right? Nobody's moving. Why not? Because there are programs that need to be uh, comprehensible for an ESL student. You need to make it visual, you need to make it comprehensible. You, may. you all are right. The standards are written for native speakers. It doesn't have any regards for language um, diversity. This is what the ELL child has to do. Every time they're in their classroom, they're learning social language, academic language, and content. Native speakers, they only have to learn content. So what do you do? How do you make sure that your ELLs are getting all three of these in your classroom? How many of you all are at a school with a high ESL population? Okay, do y'all have ESL teachers that support you? Okay, so this is where the ESL teacher comes in. They're supposed to increase this while integrating this. Do you all collaborate with your ESL teacher? Yes, no, maybe so. Do you all rely heavily on your ESL teacher? Your ESL teacher is your friend. Don't be afraid of your ESL teacher. They're your friend, they love you. They wanna collaborate with you. If they don't, tell them to retire. <laughs> okay. Here's a biggie. Teachers should discourage students from speaking their native language as this will hinder their English language development. When they go home, they need to speak English. Nobody's moving. They've got to master their, their native language before, or they, have to, they can't master both at the same time. They have to be able to do both at the same time. Do you all agree with that? Nobody's moving over here. Especially some of it has to do with their self-concept, too. Well, how can they speak English if they go home and it's in a Spanish-speaking household? Right. No, they can't. But we have teachers that tell, tell their, their parents that they need to speak English at home so that they can develop their English. That's not conducive. The development of L1 actually helps L2. So if you have the concepts in the first language, it helps them to be able to attain the second language. Do you all agree with that? I love every single one of you in here. I've heard teachers say this. I've heard teachers, and you see I have an explanation point here. There's nobody of research that supports that claim. I have had teachers tell the ELLs, you need to say that in English. You need to speak English. You're in an English speaking school. You need to speak English. I don't know what you're saying. You need to speak in English. What if they don't have the language yet? What if they don't feel comfortable using that language yet? Also, back to what you were saying, they need to make sure that they're literate in their L1 so that it can transfer into their L2 language. And also, it's part of their culture. We don't want to deny them a sense of their culture and say, your culture is not important because you have to speak English. 
I mean, actually, you should encourage them to speak their other language along with encouraging them to speak English as well. Encourage them to speak both because both are important. I'm so glad nobody went over there. I was going to get angry if somebody was going to <laughs> because that, that's, kind of the, that's kind of like nails across the chalkboard for me when I hear a teacher tell them, you need to speak in English. It's like, <laughs> I have to do that. Okay, so you all can have a seat. Thank you all so much. You all are so smart. Okay, the main reason why everybody is here. How do we make literacy accessible for English language learners? How do we do that? Well, they don't speak English, so I just let them stay with the ESL teacher all day. Oh, well, sometimes they try to do that. You know, we do, we do by law have to see them for at least an hour every day. But once they leave us, what do you do in your classrooms to accommodate these students? All right, we're all familiar with the shifts of Common Core, right? With our new standards, we have to make sure that we have all of this in place. Balance of fiction and nonfiction, bless you. Balance of nonfiction and fiction, increase in text complexity, uh, building knowledge across the disciplines, making sure you're including science and social studies. They're writing using text-based evidence, and there's a focus on academic vocabulary. So we're all familiar with that. How many of y'all have heard of scaffolding? We love scaffolding. Scaffolding is wonderful. Scaffolding is huge for the ELL child. It's huge. So basically, you're moving them to stronger understanding and greater independence. You model it for them first, you give them some time to practice, and then you move them towards independence. Everybody in here does that, right? Please say you do. Yes, you do. You do it. You just don't know you're doing it, but you're doing it. How many of you all are familiar with the gradual release of responsibility? This is huge. Honestly, this is good for all children, not just ELL children. This is good for SPED children. This is good for your struggling children, your tier three children, your smart children. It's good for all children to use this model. I do where you model it, we do, you do it together with your kids, they do, you put them in pairs or groups or triads and have them do it together, and then you do where they do it independent of everybody. This is a great way of just good first teaching in your classroom, and it's extremely beneficial for ELLs. These are the five principles of literacy instruction according to the Center of Applied Research. You have all of this in your classroom, you will effectively e accommodate your ELL children. I will even venture out to say your children that are in special ed, your children that are struggling readers, or even if you teach math or science, your children that are struggling. If you apply all of this, if you apply all of this in your classroom, you will be able to reach all children not just the smart ones, not just the ones that get it the first time, but all of your children. And this is what we're gonna delve deep into today. So can I get, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna ask five people to read each one. Can I get somebody to read one, number one? Just read it, please. Link background knowledge and culture to learning. Number two. Focus on academic language, literacy, and vocabulary. Number three. Increase comprehensible input and language output. Number four. Promote classroom interaction. I think you all do that already. Number five. Stimulate higher or the use of learning strategies. Okay, and I guarantee you, everybody in this room, you're doing this. You're doing this on some degree or another. I am not here to get you to replace what you're doing in your classroom and do something completely different. I am just giving you some ideas, some light bulb moments, just some little tweaks to what you're already doing. Hey, have you tried it this way or have you tried it that way? That is my mission today. It's just to enhance what you're already doing. You took your summer out to come here 
to listen to me talk about ELL instruction. So that, in my opinion, makes you a fabulous teacher because you could be at home or on the beach, but you're here with me. So that means that you care about your kids and that you want the best for your kids and that you want to make sure that your lessons are important and effective and you want to grow all children, not just the smart children. So I do applaud you all for that. And so this is what we're gonna delve deep into today. All right, linking background knowledge and culture to learning. How many of you all have heard of background knowledge? How many of y'all have been beat over the head about background knowledge? You know all about background knowledge. Okay, so when we build background knowledge, what are we doing? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Take what they know and add to it. Okay, taking what they know and add to it. Anything else? Making connections. Making connections. Anything else? Okay, great. Providing building blocks for them to learn. All of this is true. How do we go about doing that in our everyday lessons? How do you all make your lessons relatable? What do you do? Find out their interests. Find out their interests. Anything else? Find out through questioning. Through questioning, yes. Any other ways? Right, something that's in their community, something that's in their area, like a theme park or what have you. So basically, explicitly planning and incorporating ways to engage students in thinking and, like you all said, drawing on their life experiences and their prior knowledge. So how do we do that with ELLs? Well, they don't speak the language. They don't have any knowledge. Visuals. What I, what I just said, is that true? They don't have any prior knowledge. They don't speak the language. They have a lot of knowledge. There's just a language barrier there. So how do you pull that out? Somebody said back here, visuals. Anything else? Oh, emotions. Oh, hand gestures. Yes. Facial expressions. Here you go, here's a list for you. Things that you can do. Photos are huge. You can do a lot with one picture. You can build their language. You could just have them label the picture. That's building language. Attach a phrase to it, now they have a sentence. They can speak it, they can read it, they can write it. You've hit all of that with just one photo or illustrations. I'm pretty sure everybody here uses graphic organizers, KWL charts, picture walks for the little ones, have them walk, look at the pictures to formulate their own story, uh, shared writing. They tell you what to write and you write it so that you're modeling what good writing looks like. Have them split up in teams and give themselves a name. My kids split themselves up, they name themselves after rap songs, okay. That's what they knew. <laughs> One team called themselves Panda. The other team called themselves Boss Baby. Okay, that's fine. That's what you all want to name yourself? Fine. Okay? You can do the two truths and a lie right here. Maps are huge, especially if you're integrating social studies. Maps are huge, especially wherever you are, relate with the passages about to where they are. I did a story about Milton Hershey. You know, that's based off, the, off of Charlie, Charlie, and, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I'm getting tongue-tied. I apologize. Um, and I showed them where Hershey, Pennsylvania was on the map in relation to Memphis, Tennessee, in relation to Mexico. So now we've gone over north, south, east, west, southwest, southeast. We've gone over all of that with that one map. Also, word and picture banks, supply them a, supply them a word bank that they can use. There's nothing that says you can't do that. That's scaffolding. You know, would you have to do that for your tier one kids? Probably not. You never know, you may have to. And also videos are fine. Videos are great. Now, do we want them to watch a one hour movie during your class time? No, but can you show them a quick two minute video on something that you're studying? Yes. 
make sure you watch it prior to. <laughs> because you think you're talking, you, you may think it's about whales and then you get on there and you're like, oh wait, okay, no, that's the wrong video. So make sure you watch it prior. This is a unit I did with my students. We read a, pla uh, we read a passage called The Rainforest and um, we did a close read with it. And this is my PowerPoint that I created for my students. That was the first slide, so I showed them this map here. As you can see, the compass rose is there. We talked about north, south, east, west. We talked about Brazil. I talked about how a lot of the countries spoke Spanish. So then I reeled them in. They were really excited to read about the rainforest. This was my next slide where I showed them about the major rainforest. I got all of this from Google Images. I didn't do anything special. I just clicked on Google Images and found these pictures, put them in my PowerPoint. The story that we were reading about was about the Amazon rainforest. So that's why I had that here. I showed them this. They, they were motivated to learn about it. This was my next slide. They were so excited when they saw this because then we were able to have a discussion about how our classroom looked different from their classroom. And I didn't start the discussion. A hand went up and said, where are they? I said, they're in their classroom. That's not a classroom. Yes, it is a classroom. Well, why does their classroom look like that? They don't even have a carpet. So then you go into that discussion of how our classroom looks different than their classroom. What do we have that they don't have? Oh, we have a computer, we have a smart board, we have a rug. Do they have that? No. You know, and then you go into a talk about the animals. You go into a talk about what the rainforest looks like. So this is all building that background knowledge prior to them reading the passage. So they already have some information before they've even seen the passage. And in my opinion, this is good for all children. Your smart children, your middle of the road children, your struggling children, they all have images in their head now of what the rainforest looks like, what animals you might see in the rainforest. Oh, there are people that live in the rainforest and they go to school and that's what their school looks like. Any questions about building background knowledge? So that was number one. Number two, academic language, literacy, and vocabulary, which is my absolute favorite, because this is what I live for, this is what I do. I teach vocabulary, I teach literacy. I teach vocabulary, I teach literacy. What do our children lack? They lack vocabulary. What's one of the major shifts with Common Core? Teaching academic vocabulary. So your tier one children may have some of this academic vocabulary, but our ELL children, they don't have it yet because they're still acquiring the language. So, we need to teach language and language skills required for content learning. And yes, it's okay to pre-teach academic vocabulary. Who remembers when Common Core first came out, they said, do not pre-teach vocabulary. Does anybody remember that? I remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday where, where the Common Core police, that's what I call them, the Common Core police said, you are not allowed to pre-teach vocabulary. And I said, well, watch me do it anyway. Well, that's just what I do. <laughs> I was like, okay, I won't pre-teach it, close the door. Okay, come on boys and girls, we're gonna learn about vocabulary because research states that they need to acquire vocabulary if they're going to acquire language. So you do have to pre-teach academic vocabulary. Now, am I going to pre-teach simple sight words? No. But if, am I going to teach the word rainforest? Yes. Am I going to teach a word like maybe soil or temperature? Yes. Because they don't, they, they, they know the word dirt, but they may not know the word soil. Okay, I have an activity for you. I have a quick activity for you and this is what I want you to do. You all have green paper. In the middle of your tables, most of you, some of you, all of you, I think I put enough. If you do not have paper, please let me know, I have extra. But what I am going to ask you to do is make a quick little foldable. Most tables have an exemplar on the table. 
So basically what I would like for you to do is to take your paper, turn it this way, and we're gonna fold it in thirds. We're just gonna take our paper, flap it over in thirds so that you have three folds. And when you're finished, your paper should look like this. If you're at a table, if you're at a table with a bright pink paper, that's what I want it to look like. The bright pink paper is the exemplar. You're going to take a Sharpie or your pen, whatever you have, draw a line up top, write one, write two, write three. I'm going to take this one and show it. So, because I know you all don't have it. So this is basically what you're doing with your, with your trifold. One, two, and three. Everybody has it? Do you need paper? I can give you a paper, or you can use that one. Okay. You can have that one. I'm not taking it back home. You can take that one. Yes, please. Okay. How many of you all have heard of tiered vocabulary? Okay, so there are three tiers of vocabulary. There's tier one, there's tier two, and there's tier three. I am going to give you a pre-assessment. I have 12 words up here, and I want you to rank those words into those three categories. Which words do you think go into tier one? Which words do you think go into tier two? And which words do you think go into tier three? I am going to give you two minutes to do this. All right, I'm going to answer your question now because she's like, is tier one, <laughs> tier one are your basic everyday words. It's the opposite of RTI because everybody wants to rank them like RTI, like tier one is the high words, tier two is the middle, and tier three is the bottom. It's the reverse for vocabulary. Tier one, those are everyday words used to communicate. Now, I have draw and fall here with an asterisk. Why do you think? It has a double meaning. So if we're just talking about draw a picture, that could be tier one. But if I'm asking them to draw a conclusion, then it'll go into tier two. The same thing with fall. A few years, I'm going to tell you a story. A few years ago, a few years ago, I taught kindergarten ESL. Anybody in here a kindergarten teacher? God, God bless you. There's a pathway to heaven for you. I taught kindergarten ESL for two years, and I, read, I was reading them a story. Uh, there was an old lady who swallowed some leaves. You know, there was an old lady who swallowed a fly. I was comparing that to there was an old lady who swallowed some leaves. And I said, oh, we're going to talk about fall today. I was talking about the season. All of my kids internalized it as, oh, yeah, I know what fall means. It means this. And they fell down. <laughs> oh, I know about fall. It's when you do this. And they fell down. And I said, no, I'm talking about fall the season. And they're like, yeah, when you fall down. So then I had to, and I was getting evaluated <laughs> when this was happening. So she's with her computer and my, all of my kids falling down. <laughs> and, and so I said in the middle of the evaluation, I was like, okay, stop, hold on. And I had to teach them that the word fall meant the season right before winter. So I had to stop for five minutes and talk to them about that. Then I had to go back into the book and talk about we're talking about fall, when the leaves change, and when the, oh yeah, when the leaves change from green to brown. Yes, so we, I had to pre-teach that in the middle of my evaluation. My principal thought it was fabulous that I did it. She was like, oh, you didn't let them, you didn't leave that alone. You, you stopped and readjusted your lesson. Yes, I did, write that down, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so she thought it was wonderful, but yes, so that's why I say it depends on how you use it. Anybody got these right or close? Were some of you all close? Did you all put here over here? It's because it's a, it, oh, it's because it's here and here. 
Oh, you, you did uh, tier, th tier one and tier three. Yeah, so tier two are those information processing words, like your adjectives, your vivid verbs, your multiple meaning words. Okay, so those words need to be explicitly taught to ESL children because they may not know what the homophones are or the synonyms or the multiple meaning words. And then your subject specific words like polysimus, which is a big word for multiple meaning words, equivalent photosynthesis habitat, those are subject specific words. So are we good on what tier one, two, and three vocabulary is? And for native speakers, you may not have to teach this much because they already understand it, but for ELLs, this is crucial because even though the word apart may be something that we already know, they, do not, they can read the word apart, but they cannot tell you what it means to be a part of something or to break something apart. So why should we teach vocabulary? And should we only teach it to ELLs? In order to understand, in order to adequately ensure reading comprehension, how many words do they need to know and understand? 90 to 95%, they need to understand the words, not just read it out loud, but they need to understand it. How many of you all have children in your classrooms, they read beautifully? You ask them what's the what the story is about and they can't tell you. They don't understand the vocabulary. And what about children who are poor? How many of y'all teach in schools with poverty? First graders know about 5,000 words. Affluent kids know about 20,000 words. How do you fill in the gaps? you have to teach them that academic vocabulary. So when I talk about teaching academic vocabulary, this is a great strategy for ELLs, but it's also a great strategy for your struggling readers and for any child that is in poverty. They need the same type of support. This is a slide that goes, this is the rest of my slide with um, the rainforest. So I build background knowledge. After I build the background knowledge, I pre-teach vocabulary. So these are the words that I decided to pre-teach and then I gave them this bonus word because I knew they were gonna see it in their science class. So this is one way I did it. Another way I did it was here where I added a picture. And then I give them, I, I give them a, a sentence from the passage and I give them the definition and then that way they're actually understanding what the word rainforest is because they have a picture to look at. So when they see the rainforest is, they can look at this picture as a guide. The rainforest is beautiful. The rainforest is big. The rainforest is green. Also, some reading strategies. And this is some stuff you all are probably already doing. You all do shared reading, partner reading, do y'all do jigsaw reading, especially if it's a big passage? You have one group read one part, another group read another part. Guided reading. How many of y'all do close reading? Y'all do close reads? Yeah. And interactive read alouds. All of this is great, but this is, this is just good first teaching for all children. And again, the I do, we do, you do, the gradual release. And that's where those strategies fit. You can read it aloud first. And yes, it's fine to read the story to the kids first. That is fine. And then you go back and have them read it again, maybe as a partner read or as a as shared reading or in a guided reading se session. You want them to have multiple encounters with the text. I mean, what I'm talking about now, this goes for all children. Any questions about academic vocabulary or reading strategies? A lot of this you're already doing, right? Yes, you are a good teacher. You are doing this. Third part, increase comprehensible input in language output. Basically, making that print meanable. Uh, meanable. Making the print meaningful with visuals and demonstrations and giving them multiple opportunities to produce language. So basically having text talks, having them talk about what they're reading. 
so that they can understand text. And here are some ways to do that. Again, with a graphic organizer, structured note taking. I just had you all do a structured note taking with the foldable. That's something you all can do with your kids. If you're talking about, if you're doing a KWL chart, you can use that foldable. If you're do, doing cause and effect, you can use this foldable. Instead of having them folded into three, they could fold it into two, they could fold it into four. Excellent way for them to take notes. You give them a colored piece of paper, they're gonna go crazy. It's something about colored paper that children love. You give them a white piece of paper, they're like, oh, okay. You give them a yellow piece of paper, you think they've, you, it's like you've given them $100. So invest in some colored paper. We've already talked about read alouds. How many of you all just have discussions with your children? Just have some, some good old fashioned discussion. Let them talk about whatever's going on with them. That helps ELL children. And those children that are in the silent period, if you're having daily discussions, guess what will happen? They'll start to talk. because they'll start to feel more comfortable listening and then they'll end up talking. Anybody does reader's theater? You, that's another way to get your kids that are in the silent period to talk. Pair them with somebody and have them work together and they'll eventually start talking. Also exit tickets, all of these ways are just great ways to get them talking. You know, I mean, we always talk about you want to have less teacher talk and more student talk. That is a great way to help your ELLs. This is another one of my slides, another word that I um, chose from that same passage, destroyed, and how I get my children to talk. Um, I use this vocabulary method called Excel. Have you all ever heard of that? It's by Dr. Margarita Calderon, and she has the seven steps for teaching vocabulary. And what I do is I make my PowerPoint slide. And what you want to do is provide a sentence from the passage and then a dictionary definition. You also want to talk about the parts of speech, a student-friendly definition, and then give them an opportunity to use that word in a sentence. So when I get here to this your turn part, they have to partner up and they have to use this uh, sentence stem to produce sentences with each other. So the blank was destroyed. So because I've added this picture here, they can say the trees, the tree was destroyed. The house was destroyed. The ground was destroyed. So do you see how many sentences they can now produce because they've had that picture? Plus I'm giving them an opportunity to talk. I've even had, this year, I had three children that came to me as newcomers. Newcomers are children new to the country. I had one child that came in November from El Salvador. He had been out of school for one year because uh, the, they had a militia down there and they were threatening to kidnap him for ransom. So mom kept him out of school for a year. So he was supposed to be in fourth grade. They put him in third grade because he hadn't been in school. So I had him. I had a boy that came to me in December from Yemen. And then I had another little girl that came to me from Mexico in January. So I had all of these various levels of ESL children in my classroom. I also had children that had been in school since kindergarten, at our school since kindergarten. So I had all of these various levels of language in my classroom. But my newcomers, yes, they participated in this. And they could say the tree was destroyed because we said it over and over and over again. So they started to acquire the language. They started to know when I see this, this says the. When I see this, this says was. I know that this means destroyed. I know that that's a tree. They're starting to acquire that language. So that's how, that's how you can help your ELLs by just providing them opportunities to talk. Even if it's broken up, it's fine. Let me ask you this. What if they say something to you and it's grammatically incorrect? How do you handle that? 
Do you tell them, nope, that's not the way you say it. You're supposed to say it that way. Should you do that? Exactly. Exactly. Just repeat to them what they said grammatically correct. You don't want to call them out on it, so to speak. What do you think that will do to them? It'll probably revert them back to the silent period and they won't say anything ever again or for another six months. So never, ever do that. Okay, this is another thing I do. It's an exit ticket. Those are the five words I went over at the end of my class period. Pick a word, write a sentence using one of these words on a sticky note. They may be grammatically correct. They may not be. But it's a quick little assessment to see how well they write and what you need to fix. So when you pull them in a small group, you can go over how to write those sentences correctly. Any questions about this? All right, promoting classroom interaction. I think we all do this. I mean, I don't think everybody's standing in their classroom behind a podium lecturing to their children for an hour and a half. How do you all promote classroom interactions? Yes, games, activities, projects, whole brain teaching, morning meetings. There's a responsive classroom, that's huge. Accountable talk, that's it. That is huge for ELLs because you give them those sentence stems and you'll have those babies. I agree because, I disagree because, and guess what, guess what words they just learned? Agree, disagree. According to the passage, it says, or according to the author, so they've learned the word according. They've learned the word author. Yes, ma'am. Just having them sit like you're showing the picture in the groups together. I think they learn so much from their peers a lot of times and just um, especially hearing their peers who are at a higher language level right? they learn so much from each other. Yes. Yes, putting them in groups and letting them learn from each other. Yes, right here I'm doing thumbs up, thumbs down. Is the answer correct? Thumbs up. If it's right, thumbs up. If it's wrong, thumbs down. Look at him. They're laughing because the answer was wrong and I have my thumb up. So they were just, and he was, just, and this boy rarely paid attention to me, but he couldn't wait to put his thumb down to tell me that my answer was wrong. <laughs> I was like, the answer's right, the answer's right. They're like, no, it's wrong. He couldn't wait to tell me that that answer was wrong. <laughs> so we've already talked about this, engaging in academic tasks, checking for understanding by interacting with their classmates, putting them in groups. Here's a great way. We already did four corners. All I did was colored paper. This is a 300 font. And I put a border around it and I laminated it. That's all I did. And actually, this was able to fit on one sheet of paper. A and B was on one sheet of paper. C and D was on another sheet of paper. Buy a pack of colored paper. You can make this, have it up in your room all year long. They will beg you to do four corners. I had to tell them we're not doing four corners today. Why? Well, let's do four corners. It's like you all have to write today. We're not doing multiple choice. They love four corners. I have who has. Oh, that's really great for math or if you're doing science facts. Do you all know what number has together is? You give everybody a number up to four. And then all of the ones come over here, all of the twos come over here, all of the threes come over here, all of the fours come over, here, over there. It's just a way to arrange a group and have them do group tasks. Round the clock partners, same thing, give them a clock. Who has 12 o'clock, who has six o'clock, who has three o'clock, who has nine o'clock? It's just a way to arrange them in groups so that they are not always in the same group. And you don't always have the same girls over here and the same boys over there because you know they're gonna set try to get with their friends. Collaborative writing, 
Do y'all do any type of collaborative writing? Do y'all pass the paper around or a chart paper around? That's the roving chart. Think pair share, think write pair share. I've already talked about providing sentence frames and also shared writing. Just ways to get them interactive, get them out of their seats, get them moving, get them walking around the classroom, get them interacting with their peers and with you. That's a way that they increase their social language, their academic language while learning the content. And that's for all of your children, even your children with disabilities. Okay, the, spe uh, the special ed teacher didn't pick them up today because she had an IEP meeting. He's in your room, what are you gonna do? Oh, they pulled all of the ESL teachers to go help with testing. Oh, that's just my school. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do? Oh, the ESL, the, these ESL kids are in my room every day for the whole, all week because they pulled them to help the, the testing coordinator with tests. What do I do with these ESL children? Here you go. One of the easiest things you can do, and I know we all do this, pair a smart one with a struggling one, especially if you have a high ESL population, find a kid that's, that's pretty smart, pair them with a kid that's not as smart, let them speak in their native language, you'll be surprised what they do. Any questions about this? Last and final one, stimulating higher order thinking. We love higher order thinking, higher order thinking, yay! How many times do you all hear higher order thinking? <laughs> if we had a dollar for every time we hear about higher order thinking, every teacher in here would be rich. We pretty much know what it is. And it's a great way for ELLs to learn language. Well, you can't do higher order thinking with ELLs. They don't know the language. Is this true? True or false? They can create summaries about their stories. They can create questions. I'm using the word create. What level am I at? You all know about this. Everybody knows about blooms. They can create questions. They can evaluate the story and they can defend it. Why do you think that character is mean? What would you do if you were in that story? How is this character different from this character? Do you have to teach them the word different? Yes. Do you have to teach them the, teach them the word same? Same means alike. Alike means compare. You have to teach them that but they can still do it. It's only a language barrier. How many of you all received those wheels? Here's a wheel, now do higher order thinking in your classroom. Here's a flip chart, now do higher order thinking in your classroom. <laughs> Throw it away. Throw it away because, I mean, really? I look at that and I get anxious. I don't know about you, but it's just too many words. So. I found this, and this is what I use. It's a handy dandy little chart of question stems for each level. Now, am I going to go to my ELLs and say, here, pick one and use it? No! You can use it, you can have that. You, <laughs> I'm gonna give everybody one. You can use this as a guide when you're lesson planning to figure out which stems you're going to introduce to your ELLs. Pick one, write it on a board, write it on a chart paper, let them use it. Pick two or three, post it in your room. You'll be surprised how they memorize it and start using it. I'm gonna give everybody one of these. I made copies for everybody. This is a really, really easy way to incorporate higher order thinking in your classroom. And I would say, I would say start small, you know, pick about three of them, one from each, or just say, hey, I'm gonna pick one from Analyze, and I'm gonna go there and let me get some more. But this is a great way to ensure that you all are doing higher order thinking with all of your kids. How many need some over here? Okay. So how do you all think you all can use this handy dandy little chart? 
Any ideas? Is this something usable for you? I mean, especially, stay on the back side. You know, start with apply, analyze. Fact and opinion. They have to analyze. What's a fact? What's an opinion? Especially lending itself to opinion writing. I feel this because they're analyzing. Exactly. They can use this to summarize what they've read. And if you pick one or two and use it over and over again, they will internalize it. Then you can introduce another one and they'll internalize that. You can introduce another one and they'll internalize that. Do you have to use all of these? No. Pick three or four. And just start orally. Just start talking about it in your classroom discussions. Use one of these and just talk about it. Post it up on a chart. Have them talk about it. Eventually have them write about it. So then you're going from listening to speaking to reading to writing. That's increasing their language. Any questions about blooms? We love blooms. <laughs> Here are some other resources, like if you're trying to find passages for your children. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get in a textbook and I'm like, I don't like that story because it's not um, an interesting subject. It's not giving me enough to build background knowledge and language with, so I'll go and pull passages from somewhere else. The passage that I referred to you um, about as far as, uh, what was my passage called? Oh, the rainforest. I got that from reading A to Z. That was a passage I got from right here, reading A to Z, close reading packs. They had a whole unit on um, areas around the world. So it talked about mountains, rainforests, the Arctic, the desert. So we talked about all of those. And that was a, a good way for me to incorporate social studies while they were learning how to read. Achieve the core.org academic word finder, that's a good resource if you're trying to pick out words to teach for vocabulary. If you're really struggling with which words should I teach, you could put that in there and click on the grade and it'll tell you which words are at grade level, below grade level, and on grade level, uh, above grade level. So that's a very good resource that I like to use. So th these are just great resources that you all can use in your classroom. Are there any questions about my presentation? Wonderings, you feel better now, you feel more confident, you are doing this stuff because you all are all fabulous teachers. Any thoughts? I told you I was gonna let y'all out a little early. All right, and that's me in my class, thank you.